Welcome uh, to my presentation, uh, uh, which is called Creating a Fashion Brand's uh, Corporate Film. And I will talk about a project I did over the last one and a half, round about one and a half years. It was for a fashion brand called uh, Gani Om. I divided my presentation into three parts. The first one is about the project itself, about the concept, about the brief. The middle part is an uh, easy Python, uh, Python introduction because I used it a lot in the, uh, in the, uh, in the uh, project. Mm. And uh, the third part is about uh, some scene files, uh, break down some, uh, some files and some stuff I did and how I used Python in the project and how it helped me. So, but before we dive into it, we think we should w watch the film first. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. So that is the movie. So hello again. Uh, my name is uh, Thomas Gugel. I'm a designer, mainly doing motion design and art direction. And I work at a co-working space in Cologne in Germany. And to give you uh, a quick uh, impression what kind of work I do, uh, over the last years I did more frequently uh, some broadcast design and some channel rebrands. This one is an example I did in 2017. It was for a German news TV channel called uh, Phoenix. And uh, I, I pretty much like this kind of work because you don't, you have to come up with not just a design concept, you also have to develop a design system, what is uh, easy, ad adaptable, to uh, many different use cases the broadcast uh, station needs. Uh, that's another example. It was an explain a little explainer uh, film for an app launch and the app called Mops. Another example, I do also some illustration stuff. Uh, this was for a magazine cover I did and the magazine was uh, called uh, Perspectives. So, and if, if you want to watch the movies, uh, haven't, uh, don't uh, show it here. So, if you want to see it, it's at uh, my portfolio website. It's called 3-seconds.de. The project I wanted to talk about today is uh, the Gani Om project. And uh, Gani Om is a fashion brand. They mainly combine high-quality, tailor-made uh, fabrics with hand-drawn patterns. And uh, this looks like this that the kind of uh, stuff they are doing. This are uh, some pictures from the first collection uh, they made, it's called Prelude. That's another picture uh, of what uh, they did in the campaign. They made some nice pictures. This is the second collection. They hired a guy called Patagunda to do these abstract organic shapes on the faces. And that's another picture what the cloth is looking like, what they are doing. So with this, they uh, came to me and contacted me 
and they because they they wanted to do the next step they did uh, photos they did uh, some 3d stuff and now they said we wanted to have for the next collection they wanted to have them um, uh, some video and the next collection was a permanent collection that uh, i prepared some pictures so that's what they are doing it's pretty nice pretty high quality stuff what they are doing and when you buy stuff from them you get it in these nice little boxes uh, just put it there because i'm a big fan of these boxes they're really rigid and i think when you buy stuff you kind of expect that it comes in these boxes what was pretty much settled from the beginning is the pattern the pattern is the pattern from the permanent collection and alongside with this uh, the colors were also pretty much set and the client was already heading into a certain style direction with the previous campaigns so they gave uh, these pictures to me what they had in mind and i i like when a client is coming up with uh, pictures like this because you instantly have something to talk about the further development of the concept and that uh, what i did i dived into the concept and the first step i took was i took a deeper look at the cloth uh, itself so usually when you buy a jacket uh, like this one you have a black jacket you have kind of a bluish inlay they don't do it they combine it with their uh, hand-drawn patterns and this is something really unique i think uh, for gunny these these color clash that they have these loud patterns combined with these discrete colors uh white black and white colors and they they clashing against each other and that was was something i wanted to transfer into the film so i came up with uh, dividing the film into four parts so the first part should be the black part with the material stuff got introduced and the second part was the white part the white part where this kind of finding shape stuff is uh, is happening the third part was the colorful the creative the pattern part and the fourth one is when everything is comes together so the next step was to looking into the pattern itself and by just staring at it it kind of reminded me of some things because i do a lot of hiking and i was always fascinating fascinated about these rock formations naturally evolved over time and became some kind of pattern by itself and i grasped through my photo library and tried to substitute these patterns with the pictures uh, i've made and i came up with this one and i pretty much liked what i saw because i think it really fits the main pattern and just to give you another example you see a final shot and where the inspiration uh, is where where it was coming from and with this in mind i dived into the scene development by just uh, scribbling first ideas and but what me got me really started was playing around with some office supplies and a colleague of mine had these foam material uh, laying around and by just bending it some kind of pattern arised and i thought hey why not uh, hopping into uh, cinema 4d and uh, try to rebuild exactly these material and we I tried some stuff, tried to play around with the with the sliders and uh, tried what I can do with it and I wrapped up all what you uh, saw earlier and I presented it to the client and the client was pretty happy they liked what uh, what the concept is heading to and they pretty much liked this a lot because they they like these r natural and uh, random movement and it's uh, this realistic movement and they said for all the further development what uh, what you're doing we're making one restriction we wanted to have every of these objects of these art objects uh, to be reproducible in real world so it has to be attached to some some wall or it, it has to be a connection to something it had to, uh, some kind of mechanic inside so that was the restriction I, ca I kind of liked it and i came up with this animatic there have been a lot of other animatics but this is the one uh, with a go from the client Yeah, I...
wraps up the first part of my presentation. Now we could di dive deeper into uh, the scene first, but first I wanted to introduce my little helpers as, as, as a subtitle of my presentation, because I s with this project I started using Python a lot, and it was a big help for me, and I wanted to share this little journey uh, I took. And m I use Python mainly because I have kind of uh, basic knowledge in scripting, and by using scripting, it 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 forces you to have a more problem solving and structural approach of working, and it's kind of fitting my personally way of working. So that was maybe the main reason. Uh, the the other reason was when you start using python and use it more frequently and it gets more of a second nature to you it it doesn't slows you down anymore instead you can automate tasks and you uh, can even concentrate even more on the creative part of your project so what i wanted to say is i wanted to encourage everyone to use python even if you're not a coder i'm also not a good coder there are definitely better guys out there but give it a try use it it will it can i sh will show you next some little s s uh, little examples it really can speed up your workflow also with with little stuff so just to give you a, a, a short heads up is there a f a some things you have to know about uh, scripting there are a lot of other things but that's ma maybe that what you get started so you have to know something about data types what a string is what an integer is you have to know something about basic coding stuff, so what's an if condition to make decisions, what is a for iteration, what is a for loop, to automate some stuff. The good thing is you don't have to uh, write everything on your own. There's pre-made stuff, it's called functions, there is the C4D Python documentary, and in the documentary you can is every, every function uh, is uh, written in there, you can uh, look it up there. The, the function I wanted to, uh, that you remember it, is the print function, because it's uh, your big helper because with a print function you can print out your variables and you can see what your script is doing and it's a big help. And the thing what got me started is the predefined variable OP. It stands for current operator and that is kind of your starting point. From there you can move to other objects, can grab data and that what for me, w to realizing that was my starting point. So now I uh, wanted to uh, hop into Cinema 4D and wanted to script with you a little renaming tool. So uh, imagine we have a scene file looking like this with a lot of objects and they all have random names and you wanted to rename in a proper way. So we are starting by adding a Python tag to it. There are a lot of other ways to use Python. This is the one I wanted to show to you here. So what we wanted to do, we wanted to access the object. So we write in variable object equals op. That's the first thing I wanted to, uh, I, I told you that the operator, and th the operator is the current tag where we are on now. So this is a script. So, and by using a function called get object, we are now pointing on this null object here, and th but that's not that uh, the one we wanted to change. We wanted to change the the cube here. So with a object equals object get down. So now we are really pointing on this object, and we wanted to rename it. And that's uh, another thing you have to know. How do I access data in my script within 
Cinema 4D. So you can do that by uh, I'm waiting for this. You can do that by just drag and dropping uh, everything what you what you can see here into your script. So I wanted to change the name of these objects. You can choose any one of these. It's just uh, it doesn't matter. So you push it, drag and drop it in here, and uh, Cinema is trying to give you a direct connection to this, but we don't need that. We already have our own pointer, so with a object equals and maybe with a hello. And by executing this script, hey, we renamed our first uh, object here. That's great, but it's not that fancy because we wanted to rename all of these objects. We need a for uh, loop, so we say for e in x range 200. So, and by pushing this in there, now we are doing the renaming uh, thing 200 times. By, by executing this now, it's not that fancy because it will rename the first object 200 times. That's not that what we want. We need uh, object equals object get next. So now he's renaming, taking the next object and doing the same stuff again. And by executing, now we have renamed all the objects. That's great. But and now I wanted to introduce you in uh, your next little helper because uh, uh, you have to know what the console is. And the console is this little thing here. I will just push it, uh, push it up here. And the console is printing out every mistake you made. And you can see we're running into an error. And this is also seen by this little X over here that the script is telling you you have a non-type error. And this is happening because we are trying to rename 200 objects. And they are not 200 objects. So we have to, t to tell Python what he should do when there's no object anymore. And we do that by writing a if condition. And with a if object equals none, then please break. And when you look at the little x and I'm executing, the x disappears, Python is happy, and we are happy too. And we wanted to, ex uh, we wanted to extend these little script by, because now they are named with, have all the same name, and we wanted to uh, extend these by adding a number next to the, to the object. And we do that by using the E variable and we execute and we run in another error because Python is telling me you trying to push a integer, a, the data type integer, into a field what's supposed to be a string. So that's not that... Uh, uh, we can change this by saying, okay, we know it is kind of wrong, but we, we know what we are doing. So we are saying that is a string, that's fine for me, and then executing. And now we have a little renaming tool. By Now we can uh, copy this stuff, and Python uh, is doing that for us, so you don't have to care about it anymore. And I want you that you remember to do this little script, because I will show you some more examples and also w where I use it in the project. So this is just one first example I wanted to uh, I want to show you. I'm uh, just changing my viewport here and show you a another one I prepared. And this is something what was always bothering me when you're working with thinking particles thinking particles always lay laying on top of you of everything so if you say this is a matrix object who is, uh, which is generating these think thinking particles and by hiding these objects they are still there and when you're navigating through this kind of this optical illusion that they are still still there so you have to dive into the thinking particles settings you have to go down there uh, choose your particle group and say uh, none then they are disappearing and maybe when you have a comp more complex scene than this one then it, it, it really can bother you so what I made is a little script what is doing this for me and I will show you by just copying this script on the matrix object and this little thing has some user data and I have to feed this uh, script with a particle group. I feed it in here and by making this object invisible, it does 
the clicks for me, though I don't have to care about anymore. It doesn't look that fancy, but when you do have to do it a thousand times, it can bother you. So this is kind of a, a little helper I wrote myself. And it was not that uh, that complicated uh, when you look at the script itself. It's uh, pretty pretty simple stuff. So this is another example I wanted to show you, and that's also another one. We used the Python tag, but you can use Python in, in other ways. And by using the Python generator, you can mainly generate geometry. And what I did here, I generated a spline. And I did that by grabbing the position of these first null object and the other null object and said to Python, please generate a spline in between. And by moving that, we basically made a simple tracer and I combined these with the renaming tool so I can duplicate these null objects and by grabbing them around and pushing them around I made uh, even points in between. This can come in handy and to show you that in a more practical example I want to jump to the first scene file, uh, the stone swing scene file. and. That's a another example. The stone swing, the, the basic setup is pretty simple. It's a, a stone connected to some spring connectors uh, I have here. And by increasing the rest length, I push them. I can start this here where I, while I'm talking. So by I'm uh, increasing this, they are pushing them into the center. And by re releasing the value, it just swings back to his initial position. But what I wanted to show you here, but because we are talking about Python, is that I combined these with my little already seen uh, renaming tool and I did another renaming tool what uh, is taking care of that this structure here, all the object underneath got renamed in a way I wanted to have them. So by just duplicating these object, it Python renames all the object exactly how I wanted to have it. So, and by playing this, I have two objects and I can duplicate them even more. And I have done this by renaming it. And the great part is I can now ref uh, refer to these objects because I renamed it in exactly the way I wanted to have it. And I extended this with my script for with, uh, with, where with which I generated splines and in this script it's it, it looks a little bit uh, complicated but it isn't it does uh, all what this script is doing is connecting this point uh, this null object with this null object and this null object with this null object and that's everything what what this script is doing and I scripted it that way that I wanted to push in the amount of stones I have and by saying this are five stones the script is taken care of connecting the splines to the points where I wanted to have them. And by just duplicating the null object and the stones, I uh, don't have to care about it anymore and can really start art directing my scene and Python and Cinema is doing uh, the rest for me. That's pretty neat. We jump back into the presentation. That's pretty much it what I wanted to show you with the uh, stone swing uh, scene. The next scene I wanted to show is the level line scene, and I'm not going uh, going into and uh, going to and show you how I created uh, the the lines and all this stuff. I will show I will show it to you. But this one thing uh, I wanted to show you what I did with Python here. So the basic setup is I have a cloner grid and I had a a, spl uh, cl um, a soft body dynamic on it, and by pushing them together. Uh, I have mainly the basic movement I wanted to have in this scene and because it has to be all kind of reproducible in real world so what what would I do I would put some sticks in every of these boxes and by making a thread between all the sticks and making them some lines I have basically the main setup what I wanted to achieve and I did that by having a null object with uh, some sticks underneath, you can see it here. And I had a corresponding spline with 
10 points, so I, I knew I had 10 columns. And here's the espresso setup I made. It's nothing really fancy. It's uh, I just reading the uh, the cloner grid with a data node and looking for the positions of every clone and putting a corresponding uh, stick on every of these boxes. But the thing what I wanted to show to you is when I'm uh, I show it first. I used the name because I knew I had 10 rows and I don't want to care about the dis distribution this is something cinema can do for me and I used the name of the null object with my little renaming tool it was easy to to achieve in the set in the expresso setup and by feeding this number into the row of another little python thing I did but it's just simple math and I show you that I have these feeding in there. There I show you the data node, there the stick where... Uh, yeah. And here's the little renaming tool. And by just duplicating, the sticks got distributed because of the name of the null object. So, and I have to change or adjust anything, the script was... Uh, kind of versatile that could uh, just expand and I did exactly the same thing with the lines and I had just to duplicate them and they were distributed the way I wanted to have it and that's just with the renamer tool and by referencing the name of the objects and that's the final result so Python was a big help here as well the next scene file is the magnetic pattern scene file. And there also the, the basic setup is uh, pretty uh, simple. It's some pieces uh, of, the, of the main pattern and I had some spring connectors connected to the whole setup and I could uh, move it around and the main thing I did here, I connected every of these pieces with some hinge connectors so they sticked together, they couldn't fall apart. And I had a force also, you can see here on, uh, on the forces, that's the main thing what uh, make drives this scene. And by increasing the force, the number of the force amount, I can, it, it, it happens some kind of force around every object does that they get attracted and so by pushing them up they attract each other by pushing it down they just wrap uh, up and go release in the final position but what I had to take care of is because also uh, what I told you it has to be reproducible in real world and if you try to rebuild stuff like this I imagined I had to take care of that some kind of rope or thread is in between all the objects and when I push it on the side it folds uh, folds up and when I'm releasing it it, it uh, releases it in its initial position that was by thinking I don't know if it's really reproducible but it's not science so it's w it was fine for me and because I was already into Python I thought why not uh, doing this with uh, Python again because when I use the simple tracer I have the problem that I don't know where the objects are and I had all the time intersections between these because it was just uh, going through the object and I made this little script it is the same thing it's just making a, it's generating a spline but in a certain way I wanted to have it and I feed in in these objects uh, to clone uh, to cloners giving the index numbers and when I'm uh, showing the top view here you can see what the script is doing it's just creating points in between and when I am stopping here you can see this is what the script is doing exactly these corners when I use the tracer I have this point and this point and I had an intersection between the both of these objects and by doing this for 20 or 30 or 40 little pieces uh, it is kind of a tedious way of working so this script was helping me a lot because it it took uh, care of all this stuff so I 
had don't had to care about it anymore. It was a big help again. So that wraps up the magnetic pattern scene. And the scene I want to show you next is was the most intense scene uh, concept-wise and production-wise. Concept-wise because we had no clue how this scene should look like, uh, what we wanted. To we knew we wanted to have some cloth uh, reference in there. We wanted to show the pattern borders. That was also something we knew, but we had no clue what the mechanic behind this these object and we started out by doing some stuff in Houdini and did uh, came up with this one here and we liked it a lot and we thought that's maybe a way how this scene could work but it doesn't fit it to the thing that it has to be reproducible in real world I don't know how to reproduce this so we killed the idea and started to play around in cinema again and did some simple stuff and by just playing around we came closer to something we we wanted to uh, to have and these are just some examples uh, what what I tried and played around and that's really the fun part in cinema that you can easily uh, play around and have something in your mind and just just playing and uh, come up with new ideas and we came up with this amazing scribble. Uh, I did it by myself. And that should show you the, the, the basic idea we had. So we, had, we wanted to have three levels. The first is the ground level, the mid level, and the uh, up level. And by having kind of a m hidden machine who is pulling the strings on the ground level, the strings got bypassed to the mid-level and on the mid-level there uh, are some sticks and these sticks get pushed with some kind of magic mechanic i don't know uh, and they got pushed up to the top level and by having another color the border and border uh, the, the border and patterns will dis display on the top level of these cloth movement so I started out by creating the basic movement. So I did this one just to have this realistic movement of, of, of cloth and I did some, some other Python stuff I don't want to show you here, but it, it, that's the basic movement. I baked this out, out as an alembic so I had, uh, uh, could rely on and I can use it uh, in the way I wanted to have it. And so this is the setup I came up with. So we are now have here these three levels, the ground level, the mid level and the up level and I'm using here just uh, uh, to, uh, to show it to you an example mesh. So this is the, the cloth, you have to imagine this is the, the cloth animation. But uh, in there are just matrix objects and I use the source mesh to distribute randomly points over the mesh. And by using some effectors and I have here just a simple plane effector what is doing this it's moving up the clones in positive y direction and that's basically it almost because I wanted to have just the border the, the pattern borders to be visible so I used the shader effector to kill the other ones and by increasing the amount of clones you can even see though that this was what the pattern borders who arise and I wanted to fill the holes with another matrix object so I just inverted the shader effector I made and had the other the holes filled so this the orange ones and by displaying the top level again oh yeah I did another thing I wanted to move them in a negative y direction so when you push it through these ones are going in negative y the other in positive y and by now displaying the top level it's basically the main setup I did but what I wanted to have is at the moment all the 
clones are lined up straight in one direction. And I wanted to have that the clones got rotated in 45 degrees and minus 45 degree degrees so that I they are kind of sharing and uh, displaying an X. And because I was already into, uh, into Python, I thought, why not trying to achieve this with uh, writing a Python effector? And this one here is also, I always say that it's not that, uh, uh, ex uh, not that uh, difficult. It, it, it really isn't, but you can see it does exactly what it's uh, supposed to do. It uh, takes every second clone and rotates it in the, in the positive uh, direction and the negative direction. But I had one problem by rendering this. It just doesn't work. I, I don't really, I don't know what I did wrong. Uh, so I had to find a way around. I killed the script because I had no idea what I did wrong. If anybody knows it, please please tell me. And I uh, uh, just googled the problem, and I came. Uh, I found a uh, a tutorial from a guy called Philip Pavlov, and he achieved the same thing what I wanted to do with a simple formula effector. And so I killed my Python script and by activating, and this is the formula he is using. So, and by pushing the, the effector through the clones, you can see it does almost the same and the result I wanted to, to have. So when we are now hitting back to my initial scene file, I prepared it here so there's the, the both formula effectors and when we are activating them and going through and starting the animation you can see now they are rotating exactly the way I wanted to have it and I just in, in the final scene files I just increased the amount of clones and that's how we are came up with the final uh, the final impression of this shot, how these these uh, things are look alike. So, and the next step was I needed these I needed these splines in between all of these clones and I had already a script what was uh, uh, what what I can could use to r produce splines, so I just adjusted the script a little bit that it understands clones, uh, uh, matrix objects. I pushed them in, and by activating the object, it's just connecting every index of every matrix, uh, every clone in the matrix object with the corresponding uh, of the other one. So that's pretty simple. It's just connecting two points. And that's fine. I made a little slider that I can easily reduce the amount of, of uh, splines I wanted to have. So that was pretty much the way I did that. But I had one problem with the other one because I needed the connection from here to here. And, uh, and on the ground level, we have another point count as we have here. And by activating my script with this, my script is pretty much screwed because it's connecting the index and the, the index on the mid level and they got distributed randomly so the script uh, couldn't handle with it and i came up with an idea and i thought why not pre-sorting the clones and i made a, uh, a texture what is a, a grayscale just grayscale values and when I so, so i could say if you are in the corner for, for fully white then you connect to this if you are less white, then connect to this point. If you are black, then please connect to the point in the back. And by uh, doing so with a shader effector, I shaded the, the clones accordingly. And though that I had have access to the color value, and I adjusted my script a bit, though that is was pre-sorting all the stuff and reading the color out of it, and that's the result of it. So now I could say, okay, if you're here, connect to the corresponding point. And that's pretty much it. And it's based on this simple, simple script by how do I create a spline with a w in Python with the Python generator. And by activating everything again, we are almost done.
to achieve the final result of this scene. The last step, almost the last, there have been others, but the last problem I had at the moment, there's no geometry in the scene. So if you want to render this, it's black. So it's because the matrix object doesn't uh, does not uh, generate any any geometry, and uh, the spline generator generates splines, but also no geometry. And luckily, with uh, a matrix object, you can also generate thinking particles, and that's that's what I did. I uh, you know I generated uh, thinking particles, pushed in a particle group. You have to do that, and you have to adjust the particle priority to after effectors. That is calculated after the effect effectors have done their work and so you have the exact uh, same result as with the, with the uh, effectors. And you feed this into a particle geometry object, was what you see on the, on the bottom. And by doing so and activating them and hiding the original matrix objects, you have pretty much the same result with thinking particles. And these you can't render, you also can't render, but uh, luckily with Redshift uh, you can do this by adding a Redshift object and it uh, provides you with some, some uh, possibility that you can render particles as spheres or as boxes but also uh, with custom objects and in this example I pushed in these lists some pre-made uh, uh, geometry it's just a cube and by doing this and firing up the redshift render view you can see now we have a result and that's how I rendered the the final re result so I had no geometry at all in the final scene it was all done with Redshift and the possibility to render, render the geometry on render time. So. And I did the same thing with the spline generator. Adjusted this to showing it up at the linders. And now we are done. That's the final result. So, and we are almost done with my presentation. This is the last example for the conclusion slide. I showed you some examples what I did with, uh, with Python. It was, it was really simple stuff and it kind of evolved over time and I learned more and more and it started to getting fun and I could, it, it automated my, my workflow. And this is kind of what, uh, what came out of this. It, I haven't used it really in the final movie, but I still like what it's able to do. So I made my own little quad tree generator and it starts out by uh, having a matrix object which is generating just some points. And I take these points and uh, distributing uh, cubes over it. And the quad tree is you have one cube and you divide the cube on a certain me mechanism to in, in eight other cubes and in eight other cubes. And I, the best case I show you, so this is the matrix object where I feed it in into my, into my uh, little tool. It is a little bit more of code, but it, it's not that complicated. So but I had a threshold and by pushing that down and making it a little bit more visible, you can see here now on this when I'm pushing out the threshold, it starts to divide these cubes. And I made a, a, a possibility to push in some geometry. And by saying, okay, use not in just uh, uh, these boxes, use this geometry, I could distribute it randomly. And I also m uh, grabbed a turbulence field to, m to, to organize these, these distribution. So I can use the well-known noises from cinema. I can scale the noise. I could rotate the noise. Uh, all the stuff you, you use usually in, in cinema as well. But this I, I grabbed from the Python SDK, the turbulence object, and just use it within Python. That's all. 
and I made them other uh, possibilities so I could randomly distribute the instances I have and I could uh, randomly rotate the objects I wanted to have. It ha all the scripts I made, they all have his flaws. I'm not perfect, I'm not really the best coder at all, but it, th that's what why I wanted to uh, I show it to you. I want to encourage you. Just try a little bit of Python. It can speed up your workflow. It was really a big help for me, and you maybe can can come up with some other crazy stuff. This is just an example I I, I made. So and now we are on the conclusion slide because that wraps up my uh, almost my uh, presentation. To say it once more. I stressed Python scripting a lot in this presentation, but this was just one piece of the puzzle. There was a, a lot more. So on one side, having a good concept is for me the main thing in every project. You have to have a good concept. Uh, the animatic, having an uh, animatic in this state is good for the client, that the client knows what he's, what he's getting and uh, there he can rely on. Having a shot list uh, helps you keep track of what I what you have to do, and all these play around stuff, these R and D stuff. It is also important to come up with ideas. Uh, that was was a big help for me. More cinema wise, using the alembic workflow uh, is uh, I can I can uh, recommend these. Uh, it's just good to bake out your stuff, uh, open it up in a new scene. It speeds up your viewport and you can rely on what your thing is doing and you still can change it afterwards. The take system, I had in uh, the most of the scenes I had 1 to 12 uh, cameras and for each camera I had a different light setup so the take system took care of it so I don't have to care about this. Uh, I, w I would have gone crazy if I have to render and change. If you cha have to change one setting, you have to change it. If you have to separate, when you have separated into different files and not using the take system, uh, you have to change every in every single scene file. We have to change one thing. So that is a good, uh, big help. The Cinema 4D community is just amazing. It's great what you can, uh, what uh, how much help you get. And w if you have any question in in it, even with Python, just Google it. You will find you will find help and you will find the answer. And last but not least, Redshift. I started Redshift uh, within this project and I became quite a fanboy. It, it was it's just a solid renderer. I uh, I liked it a lot and had no problems at all in rendering. So uh, I can really recommend that and thank you for that and uh, that's it thank you very much for uh, uh, for your time and listen to my uh, to my presentation mm -hmm.